Looking into the future, the beginner faces a choice that leads him to the triumph, or not. Being surrounded by like-minded professionals can be the best guarantee that you actually take that crucial career step. Sport in Global is a digital network for sports jobs. It gives you the chance to be involved in the sports industry no matter who you are, regardless of gender, nationality, and experience. Our AI system matches up talent with human resources. Candidates who align with the company's values and needs immediately get shortlisted. It saves time for HR and increases the opportunities available to applicants. The platform identifies tailor-made recommendations based on user needs, so you're always aware of the possibilities out there right now. Sport in Global is a place where students gain key tips about jobs and build the valuable connections that are essential for people at the beginning of their career path. The path from candidate to champion starts with a single step in the right direction. Sign up to Sport in Global. Sport in Global, the best way to enter. The wonderful, wonderful. Okay. So next up, we'll be introducing our fifth speaker of the Sport in Global Summit. Uh, to tell you more about, uh, in, our fifth speaker is Dr. Pedro. A. de Alarcón. And to tell you more about his background, Pedro is a senior data scientist and head of big data for social good and sports analytics department in Telefonica. His profile is a mixture of technical skills in the data science field mixed with business development and product marketing experience. He earned a master's degree in computer engineering and a PhD degree in bioinformatics. His academic research on machine learning and content retrieval is supported by many publications and technical magazines and conferences. In 2003, he was one of the founders of Integromics, now part of Perkin Elmer. He joined Telefonica in 2007 with managing roles on innovation product, pro product marketing, and data science. Since 2017, he has been leading a team to design AI-driven tools for professional athletes and teams in several sports disciplines like road cycling, badminton, basketball, esports, amongst others. Pedro, welcome to the Sporting Global Summit. Thank you, Krista. Hello, everyone. So very, very glad to be here. I'm very overwhelmed by the knowledge shared by other speakers. So. I'm very glad to be here to share and to share our humble uh, experience in the sport uh, analytics area and also the sport industry. So let me go to the presentation. Uh, basically, well, the title was uh, Take Things and, and Data Further. So this is about technology, but not only about technology, as other speakers uh, mentioned before. So. For those of you who don't know Telefonica, uh, what we are one of the top uh, 10 telcos in the in the world. Uh, we mainly operate in countries, in 17 countries, Latin America, Spain, UK, and Germany are our, our markets. And we operate under the brands Telefonica, Movistar, Vivo, or O2. So anytime you see in a t-shirt or in a logo, this and any of these brands, this refer to Telefonica. So, when we first came to, to the sport industry uh, and considered this as, a, as an opportunity for, um, for business, we rapidly realized that this is a complex environment. So uh, many of the sta stakeholders that uh, are here were already customers of Telefonica. Telefonica is not all, uh, only providing connectivity, um, pay TV, and other services, but also uh, is helping uh, organizations to uh, transition to through the digital transformation journey. So this is something we we used to. Sorry, I should. This is something we we used to to do for for many years, and suddenly when we arrive into the sport industry, we see so many stakeholders, so complex uh, uh, relationships uh, among them, and soon uh, uncertainty about what is the role of technology uh, for them. Uh, for many of these stakeholders, technology was not at the center of the discussion uh, many years ago, or not, not so many years, but perhaps uh, 
uh, five years ago, it was not um, a key uh, topic for, for this organization. And now we see there is, there is a chance and there is an opportunity uh, for a company like Telefonica or many other big players in the technology sector like IBM, Accenture, Microsoft, uh, in this uh, whole industry. So we, at the end, uh, we realized that uh, we are very familiar with the marginal gains uh, uh, quote uh, for sport performance, sport analytics. But when we address other sectors out of the performance, we, we saw and we realized that this is not so marginal. So applying technology to these areas like uh, fan engagement or smart management and other uh, use cases, uh, there is a, a gap and there is a, certainly a room for improvement in this area. So uh, my, my t myself and my team, uh, we focus on sport analytics, but there are other parts in the company that are addressing this as a whole. And I'm, I mentioned that what we are um, using in Telefonica is very applicable to other disciplines and other uh, business areas, energy, banking, and uh, of course, sports. So we see, uh, we, we, we cannot say big data uh, as a term because big data now means a lot of things. Uh, we, we refer to exponential technologies as a confluence of ecosystems. We have the Internet of Things uh, ecosystem, all these wearable devices and other uh, devices uh, connected to the network. We have uh, real-time technologies. We have uh, cloud uh, storage and processing, analytics as a service, and of course, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning as key technologies coming coming to the to the sport industry. So those are confluence and they're cre creating like a virtual cycle where we, we have a, um, the right to play and also with, within the skills to play. Um, I just mentioned one of the uh, our flagship projects we implemented in Spain is basically to help Atletico de Madrid, uh, with one of the top three uh, clubs, football clubs in Spain, to uh, transform their uh, their organization. Is uh, so that the, the objective, the mission was to uh, add more value to the sport assets they already have. Sport asset means players, uh, fans, and of course the stadium. We put all the technology in the new stadium, the Wanda Stadium they, they have in Madrid. So all the, of course, connectivity, screens, uh, scoreboards, and all, anything you, you, you can imagine was implemented uh, in this stadium. So the, it was the first stadium in Europe, 100% digital. So that is a, a clear um, milestone. And also we help them to implement a roadmap of uh, business cases uh, around analytics and big data. So uh, the first thing we recreate is like a big data lake where they are consolidating the, and the data coming from different parts of the club, uh, including of course sports, uh, the game, the players, uh, the management, the, the scouting, the, the funds, so everything is being consolidated in a big data lake and the use cases are being executed uh, according to their business priority. So there is a, uh, and this is a, something you, you may know, so digital transformation is not something that happened in, in one year. So you need many years, you need a lot of trust and, and not, uh, a lot of uh, impact to, to have a club like Atletico de Madrid putting money on, on top of this and, and creating the value we expect to have. So uh, on my side, so speaking about more what I do within Telefonica, basically we are working with different, different disciplines as Christian already introduced. I, I will go to, to that in a minute, but uh, basically uh, we are, or I am responsible to create like a data framework where we put all the actors to work together. So basically this is the architecture, very high level architecture of how we consolidate data into our platform. Uh, we consider an ecosystem where there are a lot of startups and companies like Humanos, Humanox uh, uh, providing data, but also big uh, players like Garmin, 
and all the data we get uh, from their devices to put them together along with other sources like Opta or Yscout or Instat, Instat that are providing date, valuable data coming from eventing and, and games. Uh, we put this together, we add some, um, so we, we add the, the unique uh, algorithms or the, and the application of machine learning on top of that, and then we, we return value through different channels. One channel could be a dashboard for the cloud, another channel could be an app for the players, and another channel could be a, an app for the farm. So at the end, the, the core of the platform is the same for, for the three, for all, the, these three uh, actors. So this is, uh, we, we started with uh, cycling uh, as a first, I personally, I, I'm a big fan of uh, cycling or the Spanish uh, road cyclist. And we had a meeting in 2016 with the uh, performance manager of Moistar team called uh, Mikel Zavala. And he brought a lot of data, Garmin data coming from the cyclist. And suddenly we started to play as an innovation project, as a very, let's say proof of concept of what we can do beyond what other existing tools like uh, Golden Cheetah, Garmin tools, or uh, training pick tools that we and that there are uh, commercially available, uh, what we can do specifically for the team. So we detected a lot of uh, parts that uh, could be improved and also a chance to make bespoke uh, tools for the team. And this is, this is a great value for the team. So having something unique that the, not, no other team could have, perhaps they can develop by their own, but we were making a custom solution for them. And then we started to add more and more uh, sports as uh, they saw the results uh, with road cyclists. So we have badminton with Carolina Marine, eSports, uh, we'll go to badminton and, e and eSports later on, tennis and basket and running among others. So uh, in cycling, we are focusing, as I said, in, in more uh, smart training planning. So uh, we can ensure that before a competition, the, the, cycli the cyclist is at the top of the peak of performance. So that is very critical to have this peak right the day after, the day before the competition starts, not two days after, not two days before. So that requ requires a lot of fine tuning of training loads and, and rest uh, from the trainers. So we are providing the tool for, for the trainers to do that. We also are making a, a lot of on-race uh, reports. So after the stage uh, finishes, we create the sports, we create some predictions for the next day after. Um, of course, we could do it uh, real time, but this is forbidden. This is banned for by the UCI, so we cannot do that, uh, but uh, technically it's absolutely possible. Uh, we also integrate feelings, which is very important for cycling, how they feel. This is a, a perception, this is a subjective as, uh, asset that we have to integrate with the Garmin data. So we create models to integrate their feelings with their actual numbers on power, speed, and uh, heartbeat. And um, um, also last but not least, some of the cyclists like Alejandro Alberde want want to extend their career as much as they can. He's now 40 years old. He's one of the oldest uh, cyclists in the, in the peloton. So he's asking all the time on how to improve their performance on one more year. So this is something we are helping to. With the Rafa Nadal Academy, this is a, basically a school of uh, future talents of the tennis. So we are helping them to implement the whole transformation of the academy and to get and get like what they call 360 player profiling so we are helping with the integration of different bi dashboards and also some wearables for for the um young team players and also we are making some analytics about detecting uh, young talent in football, uh, we, this is the, the new sport we are addressing. We partner with a company called Humanox. They provide a smart machine, connected smart machine. I think we think that this is going to revolutionize, revolutionize how um, uh, performance is measured. 
So basically we have uh, two clubs already with the shims. This is for, for the uh, school, for football school of the club, also for professionals. So we are providing to, to the company the smart or uh, the more advanced analytics uh, we can have for the data they, they generate. And with Carolina Marine, this is a very interesting case because uh, badminton is a sport dominated by Asians. So Asia is the country where, uh, is the, sorry, the continent where, where badminton is so popular, as popular as football probably. And I, we would say that Carolina is the world championship and with the world champion, and she is like a, an outlier. He, she is a Spanish. And there, and there is a not a strong tradition in badminton in Spain, but uh, however, she is outperforming. So we, what we are doing is uh, to create again, be a spoke um, a tools to improve their game, the preparation of uh, games to know better their rivals, and also to prevent from uh, injuries. And the first challenge we address was to convert hundreds of video archives, hundreds of video, uh, hours of video into events that an algorithm can process. And uh, this was a lot of uh, manual work, but at the end we, we had a, a great database with not only Carolina Marine Play, but also uh, all her rivals. So this is uh, the, the base, the, the base ingredient we are using for for the analytic tool we have for, for Carolina. Um, there is also a paradox is that we have, we believe we have something so unique for Carolina that we cannot scale that. We cannot sell this tool to others because we are, if we do so, we, were, we would be canceling Carolina's competitive advantage. So that is a problem we found also in cycling is how to scale something so unique that this athlete doesn't want to share with others. So how to do that? Uh, I uh, eagerly look for feedback around how to make this competitive, uh, this very unique uh, tool uh, mainstream and, and but while keeping the, the unique in nature and differential nature of the tool. In eSports, we are supporting the, the Movistar Riders Academy. Uh, this is an academy with uh, young players, uh, 40 players uh, playing in different disciplines like League of Legends, FIFA and Counter-Strike, among others. So uh, basically we started with League of Legends, uh, but the game wasn't the, the most important thing. The most important thing was that these guys were amateur players. They were playing at home as a hobby and suddenly they, they become professionals and they have to adopt um, some professional disciplines and routines that they were not used to. So this is not a technology issue. That, that is a, a transformational or behavior issue. So, of course, we created some dashboards for, for them to, to play better to League of Legends, to analyze what they have and what happened after every game and, and to uh, um, uh, harvest the best amateur players so they can uh, send them an offer to join the club. That, that is for granted. But uh, one of the things we also did was to investigate how these amateur players are be behaving physiologi uh, physiologically when we start to play. So we use uh, wearable device to, devices to monitor her, her um, cardiac frequency and cardiac variability as well as monitoring her brain waves. And the way we, do, we did that was using this device called Emotiv. So we, they were uh, wearing this device wh while they were playing. So basically we have uh, these brain waves uh, and we see how the fact of being playing with a multitude of people watching uh, triggers their attention and also stress and many of the players have to deal with stress while they're playing. So because uh, uh, handling, uh, having precision in their hands is critical to have a good game. So this is uh, something uh, that we do as a part of an innovation project, but still very, we think this is very interesting to 
uh, understand better the physiological resp response of the brain while playing eSports. And this is uh, uh, all I wanted to, to share with you today. I'm very happy to share more details if any one of the attendees are interested. And thank you, Krista, again for, for the invitation. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Pedro, for your presentation. Very fascinating to hear about what is happening at Telefonica and with your background and experience. Uh, we're going to open it up for questions. If you have any questions, feel free to post in the chat. Um, I do have a question here to ask you, Pedro. Um, with regards to wearables versus camera-based technologies in terms of giving data to athletes, you know, how do we see the two working together? Explain a little more deeply what we're seeing in, with those two types of technologies. Yeah, yeah, that, that is a very interesting question. So uh, the challenge I think uh, there is with the video and camera technology is that uh, in order to have a good performance of the technology, we need to, to have an investment from clubs and, and leagues in order to implement in all the courts, all the um, infrastructure that uh, at least for professional uh, play uh, in the country. And this is not always the case. We, we don't see still a lot of uh, push uh, for these organizations to invest in this camera infrastructure. Uh, for some sport like uh, football, this is uh, mainly driven by the media and the content and the pay TV uh, industry. Uh, but for other niche sports like uh, badminton or, or ping pong or others, uh, this is uh, a, pin, a pending uh, issue, a pending uh, thing. And wearables, I think they are much uh, wider spreading. Uh, still, some sports are difficult because you need to minimize the size and the comfort and the comfort of these devices in order to be incorporated in in the actual practice of the sport. But uh, I think for at least for for training is becoming like a, a mainstream. This is absolutely uh, applicable and we, we are checking this in all, all the sports. Um, so, but uh, definitely I would favor the, so they, they are complementary, of course, uh, with better world you can get biophysical parameters with uh, cameras you can get more events and uh, eventing during the the play and but uh, i think for many sports there is still a need to to incorporate this camera technology and also the need to incorporate a uh, biometric uh, real time in real time it would be also very valuable uh, both for the fans and also for the athletes wonderful Thank you for your insight into that question. Uh, we do have a comment here from Raquel Nakamura. She says, it looks like competition in the near future is going to be much harder and it might be divided into two categories. The ones that are using all these data and the other that are doing what they've always done without upgrades. Well, that, that is a common opinion. I see this comment in TVs and in many, in many newspapers. And um, I don't think so. So at the end, sports is about natural talent and physical talents. So the winner of a marathon used to be some, someone from Africa. So Kipchoge, they have in their genes, they have this uh, capacity. And in many sports, this is happening. But I think technology is giving the chance for many modest and not so, so uh, well-funded teams to improve and to be more competitive. We see many uh, small teams and, and amateur players being more and more competitive thanks to technology, because this is in becoming a, a, a democratizing technology, I think. So of course, uh, as always happen, clubs, millionaire clubs like uh, Manchester, Barcelona, Real Madrid, they will ha also have la like an army of data scientists, like an army of any technology. Uh, but the, this is the same what uh, is happening now. They have millions to, to have new players in the team. But uh, I think technology can 
provide a chance for smaller teams and modest teams to improve and to be more competitive. All right.